Minister uh, next to me. Wafa Kafana works for the Norwegian Refugee Council, and some of you may have seen her speak today in the um, workshop on housing rights. Um, she um, is a project manager for the Information Counseling and Legal Assistance Programme at the Norwegian Refugee Council in the Gaza Strip. Um, and she's coming here to talk about um, women's rights within, um, within Gaza and, um, and about the conflict there. Um, after she speaks, we're going to hear from um, Barbara Spinelli, who you've already seen speak for a few moments there. And she's a member of ELDH, and she will, she's an expert in feminicide and femicide, and she worked for the UN Special Rapporteur. It says here in the biography that she worked for the um, UN Special Rapporteur of Violence Against Women in 2011, and I presume that was for you, Rashida. Um, and then she will be talking about her recent visit to Kurdistan um, and, the, and what the situation there. After her, we have Alejandra Munoz Valdez, who works for the European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights. And um, she is going to be talking about the centre's strategic litigation and, and, and trying to push the uh, International Criminal Court to investigate. Um, the crimes that were committed by uh, the Colombian state in the, during the armed conflict. Um, and it's great to have her here because the Haldane has been very active in supporting human rights lawyers, both um, through work that we've done in our Defending Human Rights Defenders Conference a couple of years ago, but also through some of our members going to Colombia with the Colombian Caravana. And much of our work has been around supporting human rights defenders themselves. Um, and it's great to have a, an almost different perspective and a discussion about um, some of the things that are happening to, to victims of the war in, um, in Colombia as well. Um, and finally, we're going to hear from Dr. Alain Bedoun, who is a lecturer in law at the Lebanese University in Lebanon. Um, and she's going to give a, a talk about uh, the legal aspects of uh, violence against women. Um, and, of course, she's from a place that has suffered much conflict and probably at the moment is bearing the brunt of the conflict that's happening in Syria as well. So, um, I think we've got a fantastic panel who can talk about um, conflict and peace across the globe. So, I'm going to start by asking um, Wafa Kwana to, to start to speak. Society for giving me this precious opportunity to come from Gaza for the first time to be in London in order to participate in this international conference um, representing Palestinian women and basically women in, from Gaza um, and sharing the impact of conflict on women that's very much uh, connected and related to last summer uh, military operation by Israelis that resulted in a devastating impact on Palestinian uh, population and basically women and children. Um, it was a long journey actually to come here, but it is really exciting. I carried 30 um, copies of this um, recently prepared and printed documents um, talking very clearly about the impact of conflict on women. Um, I hope that you'll find it interesting. I carried it through crossing three countries. So, <laughs> Thank you. For who uh, don't, uh, don't know that Gaza, we don't have airport. So to come, uh, my uh, my journey started from leaving Gaza, then to Jerusalem, then to Jericho in the Palestine, the occupied Palestinian territories, 
and then through LMV bridge with the Jordanian uh, border, then to Amman uh, for 12 hours, and then stayed the, um, the night there and morning flight from uh, Amman to, uh, to uh, Britain. It's, it's really exciting to be here. Um, I will start with showing you actually the two sides of Gaza. So this is the Gaza beach. This is the board actually, which is really interesting, exciting, and very, very beautiful. And this is the first moment that Israeli decided to have the ceasefire with Gaza after 51-day military operation last July and summer 2014. And this is somehow some good things about people in Gaza and the children in Gaza and how we cope and love even <coughs> some of the destruction. And this is the map of Gaza actually. It's a home for 1,800,000 of Palestinians living there. 70% of them actually Palestinian refugees resulted from the occupation, the Israeli occupation of the Gaza Strip and West Bank in 1967. And here is we will start with the background and context. So as I, as I started, it's ongoing protracted occupation by Israel. Israel imposed a blockade on access to goods and services and movement of, of people since more than nine years now, controlling air, land, even our breath somehow. Um, this blockade has its own impact on the uh, accessing or the entry of the building materials to the Gaza Strip because Israel ties the entry of the building materials with which or which uh, local authorities or government controlling over Gaza, assuming that all Palestinians in Gaza actually uh, have selected or have uh, provided their speech to select such local authorities in Gaza. Um, in Gaza, within the last six years, actually, we have we faced three serious military operations. The Cast Late in 2008-2009, and then Belarus Defense, by the way, it's, it's like Israeli names for the military operations, in, 2000, in November 2012, and the recent one, the 51 day, uh, 51 day is the protective edge. So, practical example, my daughter, who is nine, has to face the three military operations. It was very much easier when she was young to explain what is happening in a tricky way. That we were dancing, we were counting and replaying when we hear any firing or rockets or, you know, airstrikes. But when she, she was like nine, Last year, it was really terrible to explain to her. And I felt as a mother, as a single mother, the real meaning of like failing to provide the protection to my daughter. Um, one of the unforgettable, let's say, moments that I will never forget, as a responsible for my family, for my old mother and sisters living alone during the recent, the recent conflict, the decision that I made when I was supposed to go to the pharmacy to bring my mother the medicine, whether to take Noor, my daughter, Noor means the light, to take her with me or, or not. It's too risky in the streets. Nobody's moving, you know? Only people in real need for bread or medicine. Or to leave her in the house, where I don't know if Israel will target it, because I'm not 100% 100 sure, 100 sure if, if there is any Palestinian operatives in my neighborhood or if there is any of my neighbors are affiliated to Hamas or Jihadi, Islamic Jihad or any uh, political uh, movement. But I did the decision. I took more with me. So we were together because it's much easier to face what is going to happen together rather than to be divided and split. In addition to this, actually, we have also to these elements, we have the internal political division. That it's the most shameful thing happening to Palestinians where Hamas and Fatah, the two bigger party, uh, political parties in Gaza, they have their internal division, and that resulted in having two governments, one controlling over Gaza since 2007, and the other one is the former, is the, the well recognized by the international community, which is the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, in West Bank. This has 
a huge implication on the living conditions that Palestinians facing in Gaza. It resulted in electricity cuts eight hours a day, which is which become like normal to have electricity cuts. Sometimes when Israel closes the border and the crossing, the commercial crossing <coughs> between Gaza and, and Israel, we only have electricity for four hours a day and a 20 hours cut. I know that it's very hard for you to imagine or to, to feel it because it's totally different if you don't live it and deal with it and know how it's, it has consequences on patients, on washing issues, health, education. And this is the first thing that we will, I call my mother and say, do, you, do we have electricity today when I finish my work? So in order to plan where to go to study with my daughter or where to go to visit or to do something because it's very hard to live without electricity in a daily basis. Poverty and unemployment. The division between Hamas and Fatah resulted in, in really uh, economic, let's say, crisis. The control over Gaza by the Israelis where they control the crossing um, increases the poverty and employment. Unemployment in Gaza is more than 50 and amongst uh, youth it's 60. So you imagine that the situation, the frustration, the fear people, people in Gaza face. Gaza is really helpless and people very angry and they don't know what to do. And if, if there is a, a choice, most of them will leave Gaza. Rafah crossing and the tunnels. Maybe some of you knew that there is, Rafah crossing is the one uh, south in the Gaza Strip administered by the Egyptian authority. Because of the security situation in Sinai and because of ISIS and other groups that we are not part of them, part of them. Uh, Egypt to protect their borders, they are closing the Rafah crossing 300 days a year. I don't know why. Humanitarian cases who need actually to receive a proper health care and Gaza hospitals, unfortunately, doesn't have the capacity to provide such a proper health care. They need to take, to take this um, treatment outside Gaza. So they are between like two choices. Whether to apply for Israeli permit and to cross through Eris from the north of the Gaza Strip and, and receive this uh, health care treatment in West Bank hospitals or in Israel hospitals, <coughs> or to go to the uh, Rafah crossing and receive this treatment inside Egyptian hospitals. But with the 300 days of, uh, closure of the Rafah crossing, you can imagine that how much people in Gaza are suffering and lacking uh, adequate health care. And last but not least, with the background and context, customs and the traditions. You know that we are, that Gaza, one of the very conservative communities and societies. And most of the, <coughs> of the people there considering women as they are like a second class. They are followers for men. They cannot decide by their own. And unfortunately, laws and the practices like supporting, supporting them in the world. So, this is a Shijaya neighborhood. This is east of Gaza City. This is one of the very populated neighborhoods. It was heavily targeted by the Israelis. Resulted in 5,000 housing units destroyed totally, as you can see. <coughs> the legal status of, of women in Gaza, I was just saying that the law doesn't provide protection to women and most of the time it's like the discriminatory and dealing with women as they are second class. And different examples, I don't have much time to, to go through everything here listed in my presentation. But for example, if I decided to marry, I can't marry by my own. I need to have my father, my brother, one of the male relatives in order to, to do the marriage contract. I can't decide by my own. This is women fleeing during the conflict. This is a statement of the UN High Commissioner to the Human Rights Council in the 21st Special Session on the Human Rights Situation in the Occupied Palestinian Territory during the July 2014 conflict. This is one of the UNRWA, uh, UNRWA schools. It, during the conflict, it was used as a shelter for, for Palestinian displaced people. And this is another, another statement by UN OSHA. 
those women taking care of the children inside one of the collective centers, which is Indraspur. Shelter and wash, more than 158,000 homes damaged, half million Palestinians affected. And before that, we have already pre-existing housing shortage, lack of building materials, water and, and, uh, and wastewater is a big issue because also as, as occupying power, Israel is responsible on providing water, electricity, and minimum standard of living to Palestinians. But unfortunately, the situation is different. And the only water resort in Gaza, it was targeted and bombed in the recent conflict. Electricity cut and the fuel shortage. This is one of the women, she's like fear, and she was fear about, she doesn't know what to go, and she's holding some of the clothes before leaving. So women's lives in 2015, it's like the family life, the children, the grief and loss. Some women even couldn't, couldn't mourn their loss, because it's like 51 day, and their bodies need to go, and we cannot even go to say goodbye to them, because it was, we were under fire. 551 children were targeted and killed. They are not affiliated to any political parties. They are only Palestinians in Gaza. This woman checking on her hands. Housing and property is an important thing and it's part of the work we've been doing. We have a legal program under the Romisha Refugee Council in Gaza working to support both men and women to access and improve their housing and property. Security of tenure is essential to provide women and their families with, with uh, security and protection. Land and assets acquired through inheritance is a vital source for financial security for women. We are providing women with both approaches, integrated approach, to claim their inheritance rights through the court, through going to the Sharia court and uh, file a complaint as well as the, the involvement of the customary dispute resolution mechanisms, which is very much accepted in comparison to the formal judicial system from the Gaza community in order to keep the family ties. Livelihoods and women changing the rules, women more often paying higher price. I'm trying to finish. <laughs> yeah. The transition creates tensions between the new realities of men and women's lives and gender norms. So women always stand in order to support their families and men couldn't be like a caregiver, couldn't have good working opportunities or job opportunities. So women is responsible to go to international organization, to own a different organization begging for food item, non-food item and make sure health care for their children, protection, everything. So this is not an easy shift or a transition and it's not that acceptable, or it will result in a negative impact of taking this more, more heat of the family. This is number of people who, from Rabab Wahdan. Rabab Wahdan home was destroyed during the war, and eight members of her husband's family were killed. She said, I still cannot understand how I didn't get injured when others died or were injured. I saw the rocket, the rocket coming down. I can picture it as it came down. It was red. It was coming down towards me. This can't escape my mind. Now, if I hear war planes, I feel terrified. People of Gaza cannot endure another war. Please don't allow this to happen. You are, from, you are for us the international community. You can put the pressure on Israel. You can tell Israel that Palestinians in Gaza, they are poor Palestinians. Not only them affiliated to political parties. They are a human being. We have the children, we have the dreams. We need to live the life similar to different people. We need to have housing and property rights. I need to protect my house, not to be bumped again. Because I paid like tens of hundreds of, of, of dollars in order to have my own apartment. So this should be protected. The consequences of the conflict can be seen on four different levels. Physical destruction, human loss of life, deterioration of social fabric. It's different, totally different from Spain and Gaza. And even a friend of mine, or a colleague of mine, after seven years of electricity cut, she told me, is it really you have this uh, electricity cut on a daily basis? We are working together. Lack of economic empower, uh, opportunities. 
we recommend to do some efforts, some advocacy efforts, and be sure that you can do it. Just to highlight the impact that women and the consequences of such military operations on Palestinians in Gaza. We need to provide psychosocial support to women and girls to overcome and to go up with their own experiences and losses and the killing of their family members. Reconstruction of Gaza. We need to end the blockade to allow the entry of building materials to come and to reconstruct the, the, the Gaza Strip. We need to involve women and increase their participation and from initial start from the, the designing and the planning of their reconstructed houses. Support employment and training program for of, of women. Security of women, uh, security of tenure for women is, is important, and we need to work and work towards this. There is a huge linkage between housing land and property and women's access to their housing and property rights and the prevalence of the gender-based violence. When women owns an asset or she has the property, she becomes a decision maker. Her options are bigger and her choices, and she can play a big role not only at the family level, but even at the community level. Thank you. speakers to call. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, I've asked them, um, Wafu and Alejandro already, the, the other two speakers, um, who don't mind doing this, that we're going to run a workshop here tomorrow in the first workshop session in this room where if you're interested in hearing more um, and asking questions, then please come along to, uh, and stay in this hall and the first workshop session happens tomorrow. And I'm going to ask Barbara Spinelli to, work, uh, to speak now, sorry. the chance to share with you uh, our feelings uh, about what is going on in the Kurdish area of Turkey, um, Syria and uh, Iraq. Um, and I'm also grateful uh, to the International Association of Democratic Lawyers and European Association of Democratic Lawyers because they make it possible for a lot of us to, um, to go there and uh, to join uh, a number of delegations uh, as an uh, observer to trial uh, um, of our Kurdish colleague and as observer to the election and also as observer after the curfew. This made possible for us to have a general view of what is going on there. And uh, especially today I want to talk about the feelings of uh, uh, the um, delegation organized jointly by the International and European Association of Democratic Lawyers uh, on the invitation of the Kurdish women movement. We work with 13 women lawyers and a psychiatrician. Uh, today there are uh, here with me uh, Osge and Aurora that uh, uh, take part in this presentation. And uh, we went uh, uh, to visit uh, camps in uh, the uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, in the Kurdish area of Turkey, and uh, in Arojava in Syria. Uh, to investigate about violation of fundamental rights of refugees and internally displaced women escaped from Daesh, but also to better understand uh, uh, what is going on, why um, um, in, in this area where femicide is uh, so uh, hard affecting women, uh, women are also the most uh, powerful agent of change against patriarchy. Uh, we, everybody of us, know about uh, WPG, 
uh, and uh, they were uh, like uh, um, they became like uh, a meat uh, for newspaper. But we have to know that uh, they are not just uh, women soldier, women fighter. They are uh, women uh, embracing an ideology that is working on the ground to change uh, and deconstruct patriarchal structures. So, with my presentation, I want to try to uh, show what are our feelings about that. Everybody of us know that uh, Bourdieu teaches to us that patriarchy is the ancient oppression that uh, humanity is facing. And uh, of course, patriarchy is difficult to eradicate in a democracy uh, time or in peace time. It's more difficult to eradicate uh, during war time, during the conflict. Uh, today I'm talking about feminicide. I want to clarify about the difference between femicide and feminicide. Because when we talk about femicide, we talk about gender-based killing of women or the death of women as a result of gender-based violence as defined by Diana Russell uh, as a criminal, criminological category. But when we are talking about femicide, we are, we are talking about a sociological concept elaborated by Marcella Lagarde that means that not only physically women can be killed as a result of gender violence, but also women can be annihilated or in the possibility to enjoy their fundamental rights. And when this happens uh, as a result of a gender-based discrimination, of a patriarchal oppression in the society, we can talk about the responsibility of the state because of the state failure in dismantle patriarchal and ideological and social environment and uh, of the uh, of the gender discrimination and so uh, because of the traditional rule of male and female in the society uh, uh, women sometimes can really uh, live as uh, they are that uh, uh, in the uh, as subject of life, they just are object of the law and of the traditional rule. So um, we know that most part of uh, fundamentalist ideology share this uh, patriarchal view of the total annihilation of women's rights and freedom. And femicide is used by traditional force in men dominated society to resist to social change. We celebrate the 25th of November. Uh, remembering uh, the fight of Mirabal's sister against uh, uh, Trujillo uh, dictatorship. It was not just a fight for women's rights, it was a fight of self-determined women for democracy for everybody. And I think that today the most important example we have uh, in our contemporary epoch of this kind of fight uh, uh, where women start from a patriarchal society and try to be agent of social change is what happening in the Kurdish area. So uh, I want to focus, um, our delegation focused about the situation of women and young girls uh, exposed to human rights violation, women living under Daesh, uh, in the territory occupied by Daesh and women survive from Daesh and so uh, um, uh, women, uh, Christian women, Yazidi women, Assyrian women, Turkomano women escape from Daesh territory and uh, from a uh, um, um, territory uh, after occupied by Daesh and uh, um, internally displaced people or asylum seekers. Um, about women and, uh, living under Daesh uh, territory, uh, we know UN and especially uh, Madame Bangura documented very well what is happening uh, and how um, uh, really um, femicide uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, used uh, as uh, uh, femicide and are used uh, imposing traditional rule, patriarchal rule to women even under Daesh control because uh, Daesh denied to women a rule in civil society imposing behavior and dress code and the sun, women are totally banned from the public space so uh, women escape from uh, uh, life under Daesh territory told to us about how they cannot go out from home uh, also if before Daesh occupation uh, they were living dressing normally or they have 
were working and living in their home life after the Irish occupation, they cannot go out from home without uh, uh, being totally dressed and without uh, uh, a man accompanying themselves. So there is the denial for women to go out uh, in the public space and be subject in public space and uh, uh, the sanction for the violation of this uh, rule of control imposed by Daesh to resist democratic change and to secure the system of control of territory are uh, uh, torture and uh, the kind of violation of human rights that everybody of us know. Uh, but uh, uh, I uh, will focus especially uh, in talking with women escaped from Sinjar uh, in uh, Iraq and from Kobane uh, to uh, Syria and Rojava. And uh, what, we, uh, what, what we can say about uh, the situation of Yazidi women that is that uh, uh, feminicidal acts were perpetrated against them de to deliberately, deliberately uh, destroy them as ethnic <coughs> and religious group. Uh, when they start to um, conquer uh, and to arrive to village near Sinjar, uh, they use systematically to kill old women that cannot escape from village, to burn them inside the house, uh, and uh, to um, follow women and men escaping, uh, and uh, to um, capture them, and uh, they, uh, they organize a real system to solve them and to forcibly marry them. Uh, um, and not only uh, with uh, uh, other members of Daesh, but also organize a market uh, with other countries. This means that uh, when they, uh, people try to organize to pay for the liberation of their family, women of the family captured, uh, sometimes it was, it was not possible because the request of women from other countries was uh, so high that immediately in a few days that they were sent to other countries and it was not possible to reach these women. And uh, uh, as also Yazidi is a society with, with very strict rules and uh, um, with also feudal rules uh, inside the transmission of culture and religion, uh, for women, survive to this experience means social death, means that they cannot, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, they cannot go back uh, to their family because they risk to be stigmatized. I, um, I'm, uh, uh, I just three minutes, it will be impossible for me in three minutes to explain, but um, to explain the complexity of this, uh, uh, of this finding, but what I want to say is especially that uh, um, in um, uh, all these three countries, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, ratified the CEDAW Convention and ratified the Convention Against Genocide. Unfortunately, no one of them is part of the um, uh, International Criminal Court because they did not ratify their own committee, um, their own statute. Uh, but I want to focus especially about the about situation in Turkey because uh, uh, situation, uh, Turkey is also part of Council of Europe and ratified Geneva Convention. And uh, most uh, uh, Turkey actually is, is getting 2,200 um, Syrian refugees and only 2,000, uh, mm, uh, sorry, 2 million and 2,000 uh, Syrian refugees and only uh, 2,000 of them are living inside camps. And uh, uh, this Turkey is actually violating uh, the and they, um, violating the right of uh, people coming uh, from Syria and from Iraq and violating the Geneva Convention because they have a different legal status. They didn't uh, uh, apply the Geneva Convention because in Turkey only for uh, people coming from Europe is possible to have refugee status as uh, we intend under Geneva Convention and they uh, fit two different laws to, uh, to uh, just uh, give permits of stay for humanitarian reasons, re, um, for humanitarian reasons with, with a different uh, access to service uh, for people coming from Syria and from people coming uh, to Iraq. And uh, um, especially about the situation of women in camps, uh, they have no psychological support and the uh, guidelines uh, uh, about uh, women, uh, about the situation in, uh, of women in um, uh, 
uh, the guidelines about uh, the gender-based intervention on humanitarian safety are not respected and uh, there is no psychological support in camps and uh, really uh, we have seen that uh, the situation is particularly bad because, uh, for example, uh, the, um, uh, the um, camp in Turkey are managed by um, civil protection called AFAD and in, the, um, in Saliurfa the camp is, under, is built under an Armenian cemetery. This means that uh, there is a, a lot of control and uh, there are no agenda-based approach and uh, there are um, all these kind of refugees are Kurdish and so there, there is a stigma. People don't want to stay in governative camps. People want to stay in municipality-run camps, but the Turkish government didn't give funds to municipality camps. And all these camps are in Haria that after the 7 June election are under curfew. This means that women and young girls traumatized because they are escaping from the war, uh, actually under the curfew, and so are under bombing, and uh, we have a lot of casualties uh, of civilian killing during curfew. I wrote I, I to you some names of them. Um, for example, uh, we went in Chisre after the curfew, and Semin Kachirga was a year, 10 year uh, old, that uh, the 6th of September was killed by, um, by, by a sniper, the snipers of security forces because she went out to her home. Or Zeynep Taskin was 18 years old. Uh, she has a 35 year um, days old baby. Uh, as after the starting of the curfew, as husband was out of the city. That were, in Chisra there was no water furniture for 10 days. There was no electricity. That, that was, there was the 24 hour curfew. So she cannot phone because phone were cut off. She decided to break the curfew during the day to go uh, uh, to um, in the house in front of her, in, in front of the street uh, to call her husband and say please don't go back to Chisre and uh, when she go out of, uh, of home she was killed shoot by a snipers and she had this baby on uh, his hands so uh, the mother of uh, his husband Mashallah Edin that was a woman 25 years old immediately go out of home to save her and to take the, the baby, and she was shot to by police. And the uh, ambulance were not allowed to come to help them, and they stay uh, for two um, for two days there before they can be um, reached and their body can be uh, taken to the hospital. And this kind of strategy is. Uh, is uh, totally affecting uh, uh, the life not only of refugee people and and women actually in Turkey, but also the life of Kurdish women because uh, uh, in, uh, if uh, uh, the uh, oppression used by Daesh against women is a totalitarian oppression, we can say that the same is happening uh, uh, in, in, from the Turkish state against uh, Kurdish women because Kurdish women uh, are um, in Rojava and in Turkey applying Kojalan theory of the democratic confederalist people that say that uh, women have to and uh, men have to uh, kill the men inside of that so that uh, the fight against patriarchy is the basis of the new process of peace and democracy uh, are trying to organize the society in a different way. This means that in Turkey, in uh, the municipality uh, run by Kurdish uh, party, EDP, uh, that are all the municipality actually under curfew, there is a mayor and a co-mayor, and women are organized in uh, assembly in this, uh, that uh, decide about the situation of women. Uh, in this area, there are shelter for women, and in Turkey or the, in all the other parts of Turkey, shelters are governative and the, uh, migrant women have not allowed to go in shelter for domestic violence. So uh, this is a, a, a way to change the society that is, that is attacked in Turkey in a political way because uh, nine <coughs> co-mayors of municipality were arrested and two killed and all these were women. 
and uh, uh, the, more, the only uh, uh, newspaper agency totally run by women was closed and also uh, a woman from Guerilla that was uh, back in Turkey from um, Rojava uh, because uh, she was ill, uh, she was captured by police, she was sexually tortured and her body was taken in the public place in Bato uh, after killing, was exposed totally naked. So the body of women is used as a symbol uh, um, to, um, um, for the power to confirm the power and the ideology, nationalist, sexist and racist that is at the basis of this power. For example, AKP uh, during this election time say that women's place here at home or actually Erdogan two days ago say that uh, it is against nature for women and men to be equal. So uh, they use a conservative approach uh, just as justification of feminicide. Um, I really briefly want to talk about Rojava uh, to say that uh, what we see in uh, Rojava in Syria um, is uh, uh, for the situation of refugee and, uh, and internally displaced people that are here, there is an organization based on the co-participation of women refugees to the society. So women coming from Sinjar guests in Syria, in Rojava, under this uh, uh, Kurdish uh, um, uh, way of organization, are part of the uh, management of the camp and of the lights in the camp. And this makes the psychology better because they, there is a, 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 a dialogue between people living in the village and people inside the camp. There is no isolation nor assimilation, but there is the respect and confidence of different cultures. And uh, they create a, um, a, constitutional, a constitutional process uh, and uh, they um, enshrine in the law um, um, the gender equality principle and the non-discrimination principle. This means that uh, um, every, um, uh, every, in every situation there is a women and men representation and uh, there are assembly of women that decide everything uh, from the district to the um, social organization. And they start also law reform uh, forbidding democracy, uh, sorry, for, forbidding um, polygamy and domestic violence. So to conclude, uh, we can say that uh, um, to go more in depth, what is happening uh, in uh, the Polish area is a fight uh, not only, uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not just uh, a war, uh, we don't have to work to, to, to just work to just watch uh, to the use of harm, but we have to go more in depth and watch what is happening on the fight. And also as European country, we have to verify the violation of human rights uh, by um, uh, Turkey uh, in the protection of women and against uh, civilian population, especially affecting women and girls, and uh, try to make safe this country and respectful of women's rights before um, uh, also to defend uh, the empowerment of women uh, that are doing this kind of experience of democratization in their country and uh, empathize the you know, Sorry for taking so long time. Thank you very much, Father. And can we just apologize that there's, there's never enough time to do everything that we all want to do and it, it's such a shame because the presentations are all really interesting. I'm going to ask Alejandro Munoz Diaz to, to come forward now to, to speak about the situation in Colombia. Thank you. Um, so I would like to start by saying how thankful and how honored I am to be speaking here and coming to you today. Um, but I know it's late so I'll try to keep my talk short. So during my talk, I would like to tell you a little bit about the organization I work for, ECCHR, and specifically about its work in relation to sexual violence in armed conflict, and specifically about our project in Colombia. So ECCHR stands short for uh, the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, and we are an independent human rights organization based in Berlin that 
engages in strategic, strategic litigation, by which I mean that we try to take on cases that are representative uh, of um, a broader systematic problem of human rights violations, um, so that the possible impact would also be uh, a large impact going beyond a single case. Now, another aspect of ECCHR is that we try to challenge double standards in the application of international law by taking legal action against those who are responsible for serious human rights violations, but who um, also tend to easily escape punishments, either to a high position of power or to a lack of political will to be going after this person or company, because we also have a, a large business human rights program. Now, one of our focus points is the uh, Commission of Sexual Violence in Armed Conflict. And here we have developed projects on Sri Lanka and the Philippines. But as I mentioned, my topic of today will be on Colombia. So, to first give you a bit of an overview on um, the Commission of Sexual Violence in Colombia. Um, as you may know, this conflict has been going on for more than 50 years, where several armed groups have been involved. So, you have the guerrilla forces, such as the FARC, and um, then there are also paramilitary forces that are fighting against the guerrilla, and then, of course, there's the government itself, just to put it in a very simplistic manner. Now, all of these parties to the conflict have been engaging in human rights violations against the civilian population and all of these parties to the conflicts have been committing crimes of sexual violence. And as often said, women are being disproportionately affected by this conflict. And in our view, uh, this excessive use of violence against women, because it really is an excessive use of violence, um, is an extreme uh, manifestation of the everyday violence against women in Colombia or the way women are being viewed in Colombian society also outside of the conflict. So the so-called continuum of violence. Um, yeah, so what I mean is that this, this underlying structural culture of gender discrimination is being expressed in, an, in a very extreme manner in the violence that is being committed against women in conflict. And when it comes to Afro-Colombian and indigenous women, apart from this gender discrimination, there's also this additional racial discrimination, which has resulted in even higher rates of violence against these women. Now, in spite of all of this, there is a particular high rate of impunity in relation to crimes of sexual violence in Colombia. And this is first of all due to the fact that um, sexual violence in Colombia as also in many other countries, is being massively underreported. And this underreporting has various reasons. Um, one often speaks of a feeling of shame and a social stigma attached to sexual violence, but you should also think of a lack of security. Um, women may fear that they will receive repercussions when they report a crime, and there are no adequate protective measures put in place for them, or perhaps no protective measures at all. Um, a lack of medical and psychological support also plays an important role here. And also the fact that many areas in which this violence occurs are quite remote from cities, uh, meaning that um, these institutions are often not readily available to women and they might not have the means to travel to them. So it's also a very practical obstacle. A high level of militarization uh, forms a further barrier, which, as you can imagine, is, is a particularly strong obstacle when uh, the perpetrator of such a crime was someone from the army. Now, even when women do overcome this initial barrier of reporting, uh, and they do come forward, then often crimes of sexual violence are inadequately documented and judicial and investigative officials tend to lack a specific gender expertise to be adequately dealing with these crimes, which is, is shown in the way um, the victim is being questioned and her credibility is, is being assessed. 
but also uh, during judicial proceedings where often a higher standard of proof is required for sexual violence as opposed to other crimes. So I'm telling you this just to give you a bit of an idea of the very many different ways in which women who become victims of sexual violence in Colombia um, face all these different um, gender barriers to justice from the very initial reporting stage up until late in proceedings. And these are barriers which can be judicial, institutional, but also social, economical and political. And of course, as you can imagine, all of this creates a serious distrust in the Colombian justice system which uh, will make women even less likely to come forward about the crimes, uh, which will only increase the already high rates of unreported cases. Now, it's not the case that the Colombian government has not been doing anything in this regard, because they have implemented quite a significant number of laws and directives that are specifically addressing this issue, and you should think of the development of gender guidelines for investigating prosecutors, protocols for comprehensive healthcare, as well as um, zero tolerance policies in the armed forces. But the problem with these measures generally is that they tend to look quite nice on paper, but then they are not properly implemented. So, in this sense, uh, we wanted to raise this issue on an international level, which is why we, together with our Colombian partner organizations, Sisma Mujer and Gatana, uh, we decided to submit a communication to the International Criminal Court. And our communication specifically addresses sexual violence uh, as crimes against humanity and specifically uh, being committed by state forces. And the reason we focus on state forces is because of this double standard approach I mentioned earlier. Because while sexual violence is being committed by all parts to the conflict, there is a particular high rate of impunity when it concerns forces of the state. And also, um, on an international level, the ICC doesn't address so far um, the um, crimes against humanity committed by state forces, with one exception. And in any case, there's a particular uh, devastating impact when these crimes are being committed by the state, as these are supposed to be the very authorities that are protecting the civilian population. Um, now, so, the um, Office of the Prosecutor last year has published a policy paper specifically addressing um, the investigation and prosecution of sexual and gender-based violence. And here they have um, identified the specific gender barriers to justice, which are a lack of protective measures, um, discriminatory attitudes and gender biases, and a lack of political will. So, very elements that are also present in the Colombian situation. So, this is also something we really stress in our communication. Um, that that the opt of the prosecutor should be applying the standards set in the policy paper to its current analysis in Colombia. Uh, because, as for now, uh, the Office of the Prosecutor notes that even though domestic investigations of sexual violence are limited, um, positive steps have been taken, and even though Colombia is not there yet, um, they might be there in the future, so we will continue to monitor the situation in Colombia. So, um, I will wrap up here. Um, now, as you may know, uh, about two months ago, uh, an agreement was being um, between the government uh, and the FARC. And this was an agreement to set up a, a special peace jurisdiction, which allows for the creation of a judicial body that will um, has the competence to be dealing with cases involving crimes uh, committed in the context of the conflict. And while at the beginning there wasn't a single woman sitting at the negotiation table, uh, women in Colombia have really been pushed to be included here, and uh, in the end uh, there was a significant number of gender experts and women's rights organizations. 
um, which has resulted in explicit recognition of the crime of sexual violence as a grave crime that can definitely not be met by an amnesty or a pardon. Um, and these developments have of course been positive, but we will continue to closely observe to see what's going to happen here as we're still in its very early stages and we will continue to be reaching out to the ICC. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to ask Alan Bellu now to speak. Um, I just want to, we're probably just going to have to end at six, unfortunately. And I just want to say before Alan gets up to thanks very much to our interpreters, but they are only booked until six. avec la femme dans notre région moyen orient So, as you know, our conference today and what we're looking at is the role of women and, and peace, and women in peace. And so, if it's okay with everyone, what I'd like to do to start off with is I'd like to show you a film. themselves and their daughters too. They fled here in search of safety and shelter, yet find themselves exposed to exploitation and abuse. On a dusty plain in the desert, the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan is home to 100,000 people and grows bigger every day. But deep within the camp, there's no sanctuary for the women, just fear. Many left husbands, brothers and sons behind. Now they're preyed on by men, roaming free in a lawless place. And this is what they're afraid of. A trip to the toilet at night is now too terrifying for many women in this part of the camp. The men come mainly from Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. In the guise of donors, they offer charity and in return demand a wife. 
But these are marriages of convenience, for the men at least, often lasting just a matter of weeks or even days. Abu Sanad is a father of two girls. Well, bon, je vais continuer à faire ce que vous avez vu un peu. On va exposer un peu notre petit film aussi. Donc, euh, la, la question de la paix, en effet, la question de la femme, ce n'est pas une question de nouvelles, ni la question de la paix. Ce sont des questions qui ont préoccupé l'humanité depuis longtemps. Euh, je ne veux pas être trop long avec vous parce que c'est trop fatigant cette journée peut-être mais c'est très intéressant en même temps euh, je, vais passer, je vais discuter cela en trois parties la première c'est le rôle de la femme et son importance d'où vient le rôle de la femme So, and they're going to continue to continue to just off the back of what you were able to see on that film. We will be able to watch the films again after I've spoken. And um, basically, I also want to show you another film that I brought with me to do the piece. So, um, with quite this issue of women, it's not a new one. We've been concerned with women's role um, for a long time, um, for a very long time, too long, um, since the start of humanity. I know I'm not going to make mine a very long intervention because I know that today has been a very long day. It's been very tiring, but at the same time it's also been very interesting. So I've divided up what I'm going to say about women into three parts. The first is the role of women and its importance. So the woman plays a role very important because she plays the role of the educative and les enfants et même les adolescents pendant toute leur vie. And so women play a very important role. Their role is so important because they're the educators. They're the people who educate children and adolescents from the time that they are born throughout their entire lives. Mais on, on pose la question maintenant. Est-ce que l'internet joue un rôle important ou un, un, un rôle qui modifie, modifie le rôle des femmes dans l'éducation? So we ask ourselves now uh, another question. We ask ourselves in today's world the important question of what about the internet? Does it also play an important role or modify women's role as an educator? Donc ce, ce rôle important de la femme, euh, est-ce que c'est seulement qu'il faut s'arrêter à ce rôle éducatif où il faut que la femme joue un rôle d'autre part au niveau de la décision politique. Um, so, although we've said that women's role is an important, is it restricted to this educative and educator capacity, or can it also be a role as regards political will? Voilà, on, je passe à la deuxième partie et c'est l'importance de la paix, les obstacles et les conséquences. Et so now on to the second part of my speech, which is to do with the um, importance of peace, obstacles towards peace and consequences of peace. Bon, la, la paix est une condition nécessaire pour le développement de l'humanité et pour la vie des gens et pour la prospérité de la société. C'est pour cela que la Charte des Nations Unies a fait de la sécurité et de la, de la paix du but principal. Um, so basically, peace is very necessary in all aspects of life. It's necessary for the people. Et on peut dire que ce sont. Um, and for people's lives and also for society to prosper. And that's why the UN Charter has put peace and security at the centre most important and um, its principles. On peut dire que ce sont les deux buts principaux de la Charte des Nations Unies. Les autres buts de la Nations Unies ne sont que des buts moyens. Malheureusement, la, les Nations Unies 
qui se sont construites pour imposer la paix et la sécurité mondiale n'ont pas réussi à faire cela. And unfortunately, though, the UN that was put together, it was built on this very aim of trying to impose peace and security around the world, has failed in the recent. Des milliers de guerres partout dans le monde qui ont ravagé à l'intérieur des pays et partout ont été des forces de catastrophes partout. Millions of wars that ravaged countries and catastrophes that we've seen unfold absolutely everywhere. Les conséquences, donc, c'est des catastrophes partout, à tous les niveaux, et en particulier au niveau des femmes. So what we can see then, the results of war are catastrophes everywhere, and specifically catastrophes on the level and that affect women. Et alors, là-bas, je passe à la troisième partie, c'est la paix et la, la paix et la femme dans le contexte de convention. So now I'm going to the third part of my talk, which is peace and unity within the context of conventions. Donc on sait très bien que la règle du non-recours à la force est une règle principale dans la Charte des Nations Unies. So we know very well that the, having recourse to force is um, one of the goals that is within the UN Charter. Et alors là, quand les droits de la femme font partie des droits de l'homme et ces droits de l'homme n'étaient pas respectés, on, les Nations Unies ont accédé à faire une autre convention sur les droits de la femme. So we know that women's rights are supposed to be contained within human rights. They are human rights, but obviously because they have been um, Mais having est -ce que là à the UN, has been able to um, make another, has had to make another law to specifically deal with women's rights. Mais est-ce que cela a résolu le problème? Donc, la place de la femme est toujours inférieure à ce qu'il faut de faire. Um, so basically, can we say that these new uh, women, um, these new conventions dedicated to women's rights have actually made any difference? Have they actually reduced the problem? Because they'll see that women's place is very much inferior to the place of men.